Leads, leads, leads. What is happening? Welcome to Working Hours, a show about a place called Leeds, a time called now, and an activity called work. Working Hours wants to record 1,000 loiners over the course of this, the most important decade in the history of the human species, and ask them about what they do all day and hear how they feel about it. My name is Simon, and this is all my fault. My mission here is to try to map out what my city, Leeds, a city that has declared a climate emergency, did during humanity's biggest emergency. On working hours, we hear how loiners have, are, and will be coping with our multiple and expanding crises during their day-to-day working hours. Can we turn things around? We'll find out. To tell this story, I need loiners, loiners like you, dear listener. I need people in Leeds or people from Leeds to come on this show and just tell me what they do and let me record how this decade affects us. Please do donate any amount you can to the Working Hours Project through PayPal or consider sustaining Working Hours with a regular £1 a month or more subscription on Patreon.com. Addresses for support are in the outro. This is intended as an expansive and expensive long-term project which I want to make available to anyone and I can only do that with your help. So if you can, please help. What did you want to be when you grew up? It's always a great question to start a conversation. I think that I initially I wanted to be in the uh, Navy. Um, and certainly when I was about 13, that was my ambition. And then because of my age, um, uh, uh, my generation, um, the Falklands War came along and that kind of changed my attitude, to be perfectly honest, in all sorts of ways, actually, in the end. But I think, you know, as I've said to you before, uh, my real ambition was uh, from the age of 10 to be a photographer. And in fact, I was intending to be a photographer within the Royal Navy. They have uh, a specialist arm of the Royal Navy for photographers. So photography was always my passion, really, mm. from a very early age. So was that just, as you said in your bio to me, was that just from getting a camera or was there something else that captured your imagination with it? Yeah, it was. Um, My mum bought me um, a Polaroid camera when I was 10 Mm. for Christmas. And um, I think I was fascinated by capturing a moment in time. That was the initial thought. You know, you have to remember going back into that sort of generational gap. You know, I mean, I'm talking, I was born in 1967. So, you know, it was 77 when I got the camera. Um, and, you know, we didn't have social media. We didn't have images being bombarded in the way that we are today. So to see something sort of manifest itself and capture that moment in time was something really fascinating. And then I very quickly discovered that with Polaroid, you can manipulate the image and change it. I I always used to love the old adage of the camera never lies. And of course, we all know that absolutely that isn't the truth. And today, of course, with AI, that's even less true to be there today. Um, But yeah, I loved manipulating the image. And I think that was the thing that uh, really appealed to me about photography. And certainly in terms of my own private photography work, the work that I do sort of on a non-commercial basis, mm. that's still something that fascinates me today. That manipulation of the images. Mm. Did you did you study it? Did you do a degree? Yes. In it? Yeah. Yeah, I was really lucky because um, I went to a, a, a standard comprehensive uh, secondary school that actually taught O level photography and visual arts. Um, I went on to do A level photography and mm. visual arts, and then I went to college. Um, after I left, uh, after I left sixth form. So yeah, I was, I was very lucky. Mm. So was that kind of your first dark room experience? Yes. Yeah. yeah. How was that? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's really strange. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a strange environment. And of course, you know, as you hit on you know, at that time we were, everything was analog. We were playing around with chemicals and, mm. you know, paper and working in the dark most of the time, which is really kind of weird. <laughs> it's a strange environment, but yeah. yeah. Do you miss that? I do in a way. Yeah. I was always, a, I was always a bit of a purist and I, when digital photography came about, I was probably very skeptical about it. Mm. And I thought, you know, maybe it doesn't really have a future, mm. uh, how wrong I was. Um, but yeah, uh, what's interesting now on it, 
there is a resurgence of analog photography, film photography generally. Um, but I think the challenge for film photographers still is, is the development aspect of it. Mm. Unless you have a really good, sophisticated um, darkroom function, it, you know, the access to, it's mm. still very difficult to do the things that you'd want to do with, uh, with photography on film and on paper. Mm. Um, anybody really these days can edit um, a, a digital image and, and produce some amazing results. Mm. Um, and that's very difficult to replicate in film and on, on paper. So yes, in one way I do miss it because um, it was great fun, but in another way, I think digital photography is, you know, quite clearly the future. Mm. <laughs> You're listening to series four, episode three, and to my guest, Simon Robertson. This is another Zoom interview recorded on the 6th of January, 2023. Hey up. Simon Robertson is a professional commercial photographer based in Leeds who specializes in the hospitality industry. He primarily photographs interiors, events, and food across the north of England. Simon's love of photography began at age 10 when his mum gave him his first camera for Christmas. Simon studied photography and visual arts in his hometown on the Isle of Wight. Then, following his dreams of becoming a professional photographer, he travelled to London, where he met some of the biggest names in the industry. Now, among Simon's clients are multi-million pound property developers, architects, interior designers, restaurants, bars and cafes. Simon prides himself on his style and approach, which is collaborative and communicative throughout the assignment process, which ensures the very best results are achieved. Today, Simon is happiest when he has a camera in his hand. When he's not working with clients, he pursues his love of urban and street photography. Simon is also currently working on a project with chefs around Leeds called Shooting Chefs. To find out more about Simon's photography, go to simonrobertson.photography. Remember, listener, there's five ways you can support any podcast, and the more of these you can do, the better for the shows you like. Follow, listen, share, guest, donate. Loiners, get your ass on this show and then get your friends and neighbours on it too. Join me on Patreon or Ko-fi or throw in a donation. Support the show on social with likes, follows and shares. Share and recommend the show wherever and whenever you can. Right, let's do this. Episode 83 of Working Hours with Simon Robertson. So my next question would be the kind of how did you get into it? But obviously you've gone into a kind of education route. How easy was it to kind of find work and what was your route into it? Did you start with someone else and kind of apprentice or did you just go straight into, I'm setting myself up as a business. I'm going to take yeah. photos. No, I, um, so I, I grew up on the Isle of Wight mm -hmm. um, and I studied photography on the Isle of Wight. Again, very fortunate that there was a, a photography and visual arts college at, at, on the Isle. Mm -hmm. So once I completed my course with that, I left to go to London, um, which at that time and perhaps still is the, the center of the photography world, certainly in the UK. And I, I went with the ambition of becoming a professional photographer. And again, this is pre-internet days where jobs weren't advertised anywhere other than on physical bits of paper, either in magazines or in the case of the photographic industry with um, an agency. Um, and you used to have to go to the agency every Thursday morning, uh, in town, in the West end of, uh, of London, and you'd literally thumb through a folder of job adverts, mm. uh, for things like photographer's assistants, which is the typical way of entering into the photography industry. Mm. Um, and I did that for a number of months. Um, and then I, I built up a relationship with, um, one of the people in the agency. And they came to me one day and said, look, there's a, there's a, a, a company that sell photographic equipment to professional photographers. Um, and they would give you an opportunity to meet lots and lots of people, lots of mm. professional photographers and use that as a way of getting into, uh, into uh, working as an assistant. Uh, and it was a highly competitive industry and I thought, yeah, that makes sense. So I actually joined a company um, who sold photographic equipment uh, and I did indeed meet a lot of photographers, a lot of uh, very talented, but some very famous people, for example, um, Lord Litchfield and, uh, and others like him. Um, 
And I worked there, really enjoyed that. And I actually got a little bit distracted because uh, I started to get really interested in the retail side of of the photographic industry mm. rather than the actual creative side. <laughs> um, so that was really how I got into it. Um, and it sort of developed from there, really. mm. excuse the pun. I'm thinking about, you know, so you're working on a particular project at the moment and that, that you know, in recent years, you kind of specialized in food and you mentioned they're getting into, like, you've obviously had a keen interest in the tech and in what it can do, you know, yeah. like the actual cameras, the, the parts and, you know, you, it's a physics world as well, because you're doing light and all of these yes. kind of things. Yeah. Um, so how did you have kind of artistic pretensions or was it always very kind of commercially minded where you like, like, yeah, what, what was your kind of photographic, like what was, what were you aiming towards? Did you want to be yeah. more like these celebrity photographers or? <laughs> I think, yeah. I mean, going back to the, to how I got into photography and talking about the retail side, I think one of the things that frustrated me at the time when I was going and thumbing through these jobs was that most of the people that were advertising were probably sort of advertising photographers or what we used to call product shop photographers. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, it didn't interest me. I was like a lot of people in their sort of late teens, early twenties, I was really keen on music and fashion. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's where I wanted to go. I wanted to be involved with the music industry, mm -hmm. um, and sort of the fashion side of things as well. And I always, I always thought that I would be a fashion photographer mm. um, or that I would end up shooting videos for, for bands. Mm. Um, so that was sort of where I saw myself and certainly in that creative environment. And so the, the kind of hard nosed commercial stuff didn't appeal to me at all. And, mm. and I turned down opportunities to work in that area. In hindsight, was that the right thing to do? I don't know. But, uh, possibly not. Um, but you know, the, the, the truth of the matter is that's what I did. Um, mm. and so that's how I ended up going into retail, but to answer your question about the creativity, it's always been about creativity for me. Um, I think a lot of photographers, um, would probably say that they're frustrated artists of one kind or another. Um, in my case, I love to draw and paint, but I'm not very good at it. Um, and so I find it much easier to capture or produce an image, uh, using technology, using cameras and, mm. uh, and editing functions. Mm. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I, I'm a frustrated artist. It's just, mm. I, I mean, the fact that you, you thought of coming into it through a kind of Navy route, I mean, that shows a kind of like an awareness of the industry, you know, that there are all these other possibilities that it's not just you know, photo shoots and portraiture or journalism, yeah. but you know, like every industry needs images. And we've talked, you know, obviously about the digital revolution, which we're living in or beyond, depending on your point of view. Mm. Um, but like how, I think I mean, what I want to ask here is like how much control you kind of have over the images you produce because obviously you're producing them for clients as well and like does yeah. that does that leave you you know does, is your creative kind of juices fulfilled with that you know like or, or are you kind of still the frustrated artist i suppose yeah it's a, that's a brilliant question um the truth of the matter is that it is always a balance you know and i think the key thing really is to sit with the client and get to understand what it is they're trying to achieve with the images um and you're absolutely right i mean when i when i do a shoot for a client i have to think not just about my own creative ideas about that shoot but also what the client's end goal is and, mm. and what they're wanting to achieve one of the great things about digital photography is that of course you don't necessarily have to corrupt an image in order to edit it. So mm. I can take an image from my camera, put it into a, a software platform, um, and I can make a number of copies of it and I can do a number of different types of edits. And then what I can do if the client hasn't got a clear and clearly defined brief, then I can send them some different examples of the yeah. edit so i could say to you look you know this one's really light this one's a lot darker and a lot moodier um what which way do you want to go with it um but generally speaking clients are pretty good i mean especially in the hospitality sector which is where as you mentioned earlier i specialize they're very attuned 
adapt to how they want their venue to look, mm -hmm. how they want their food to look. Mm. Um, and, you know, that's really useful and really helpful. And of course, generally speaking, especially with chefs, um, they're very creative people as well. So they're also open to new ideas. And, you know, I've seen, you know, bless them, I've seen photographers shoot for food and it looks absolutely dreadful because it's, mm. it's overlit. It's just, mm. just doesn't look right. You want something that really appeals to, uh, to, to the, to the person that's going to be eating the food. Mm. Um, and only a chef really knows exactly how they want to see their, their, their food being presented. Mm. Staying with the digital stuff. I want to, mm. uh, basically explore has, what's the danger of it killing your industry? Like, are you working more <laughs> or less now? Like have, have photographers gone to the wall? I kind of suspect how you're going to answer this. Cause I know some other photographers, but, um, yeah. 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 Smartphones are a, a, a massive uh, challenge to the professional market because, um, and uh, you know, I have a, a smartphone with an, a, an amazing camera on it. I don't tend to use it very often. I, I probably take more pictures of my dog on my phone than I do have anything else. But the truth of the matter is that it is, as I said earlier, now possible for pretty much anybody to take a reasonable photograph, put it through, um, online editing software, which is easily available. Some of it is free and you can produce some really great results for social media. And, and that's absolutely great. And I, I use social media myself, um, I have nothing against social media at all. In fact, it's a, it's a great platform to get your work out. Um, I suppose my argument would be, and it's probably the same for any professional photographer is that, you know, I've had years of training, uh, and years of experience mm. to make sure that I get the perfect results. And it goes back to what I was saying earlier, you know, um, I spend time talking to my clients about how it is you want your, either your venue or your food to look, that's not possible with a smart camera, a uh, smartphone camera, because you know, it's, it's all in the moment. It's a, it's a, a fleeting moment, isn't it? Mm. You know, and, and, you know, I've seen some brilliant food photography being shot on smartphones and, and posted on, on Instagram, but I can also see the technical issues with it and, and the reasons why you wouldn't use it. For example, if you're producing. Um, uh, if you're writing an article about your food, for example, you wouldn't use smartphone photography to illustrate those, those dishes because it just wouldn't be good enough quality. Mm. Um, and it's, I suppose, you know, if I really dig deep into my particular area of interest, which is the hospitality sector, what I would say to people is, you know, you wouldn't skim on the ingredients that you use for your food. So mm. why would you present your food in a way that is effectively, you know, a cheap and cheerful way of doing, mm. um, it, 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 you know, it says a lot about you as a, as a, as a creative, as a, as a chef, mm. if you're only relying on those images, what I would say is, you know, let your clients take the smartphone images, um, when they're in your restaurant, absolutely fine, you know, do that. But if, if these are pictures that you want to use to promote your business, mm. then I think you really should be talking to professional photographers. Yeah. Yeah. You want the highest quality to begin with, and then you can kind of, you know, you can use that however you want then. Absolutely. Yeah. Down and, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the images that I take, uh, uh, you know, without going too technical into sort of megapixels and what have you, the, the, the truth of the matter is that you can still scale the images that I take down and use for Instagram and, uh, and uh, other social media platforms. Mm. Um, but what you can't do is take a, a smartphone image and scale it up. Um, to, uh, say a magazine article, for example, mm -hmm. you know, if you talk to a magazine publisher and say, I've taken this photograph on my smartphone, um, is that okay? They'll probably turn around and say, no, absolutely not. Mm. Yeah. And I, I mean, I don't know. So my, my impression of the industry, you, you get, you, you know, photographers are kind of specializing in, in, in various areas. So people that are like, you know, in, in business, small business photographers, they'll yeah. normally be doing like weddings, schools, those kind of yeah. like jobs and gigs or a particular thing for something. Yeah. But a lot of the time there will be people like you who specialize in, in an area or a sector like hospitality and food, other image products, uh, like product images, uh, people mm. who do specific journalistic work. Like I'm thinking of 
you know, if the, the Yorkshire Evening Post come and do an article on something, they'll bring a photographer along. They'll yes. probably have someone that they use on a regular basis for those kind of jobs. Yeah. Right? So is it, is it all about just building that client base and keeping that client base? Is it like, or are you, is there just enough work that, you know, you can just find jobs coming along or is it matter of, because people like to be at, buy from people. So I imagine a lot of it will be building relationships with people who come back and rebuy. Is that? It that is. Case? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. Um, and you know, the, the phrase people buy from people has never been more true. I think, mm. um, you know, you have to trust someone. Um, I think the great thing about photography over and above many other sort of service-based industries is that there is a tangible way of, of measuring somebody really, if that, you know, doesn't sound too harsh. The truth of the matter is that if you look at my website, you don't like my photography, you're probably not going to engage with me. Mm. Similarly, you know, you know, we would hope that the, when you look at my website, you think, oh, actually I really like Simon's style. I like the way that I can see that there's a, there's a style, there's an approach to photography there, and that suits what I'm looking for. Um, mm. And what I do isn't going to suit everybody, as I say on my website, isn't it? It's, you're going to look at my images and you're either going to like them or you're not. Um, photography is a very sub subjective, like any, uh, and I'm uh, perhaps being a bit controversial here, but like any art, mm. it is very subjective. You know, um, an image that I look at that appeals to me may not appeal to you. Mm. Um, you may, may see things completely differently to me and you may like my photography. You may not, you know, it's, it's. It's almost as simple as that. It's a little bit, and again, going back to the sort of the hospitality thing, it is a bit like being a chef. You know, I can, I, I've been to some fantastic restaurants here in Leeds uh, and been served some amazing food. Mm. Did I enjoy it? No, I didn't, you know, because I could appreciate the, the skill and the, the talent that went into it, mm. but I didn't enjoy it because I didn't enjoy that particular cut of beef or, you know, whatever it was. Yeah. Or that mix um, of flavors or you absolutely, know, that particular yeah. food or yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, um, you know, it is, it is very subjective and, uh, people will, will either like your images or they won't. Mm. So, uh, yeah, so I'm going to go into, I'll just go into the general questions of like, you know, the various areas that have affected, cause I think we kind of covered how you got into the role. Mm. Um, Although it might be worth just spending a little bit of time, like just talking about when you set up for yourself, like, yeah. had you done a few years of assisting at that point? Like, how was that step into, did you have clients already or was it just a total loop of faith? It, it was a total leap of faith to be yeah. perfectly honest with you. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you, you know, in life, you get to a point where you decide, you know, what you want to do. And, and, and I felt, you know, passionately that. I'd always pursued the wrong avenues, you know, going back to what I was saying to you earlier about um, going into the retail sector. It didn't move me in the direction that I had originally intended. Ironically, it moved me in a, in a different area because I fell in love with retail sales for a period of time mm. and thoroughly enjoyed it. And I don't regret it for a moment. I, I loved doing it. And I think, you know, sometimes it's good to have a whole sort of range of different things that you've done in your life mm. um, so that you can appreciate when you do find that one thing that you love doing, mm. you can appreciate all the nuances of things like the, you know, the running of the hospitality industry, perhaps as a slight aside, the reason I moved into hospitality is because I was brought up in an environment on the Isle of Wight where uh, my parents ran, um, a small hotel. Mm. So from a very, very early age, I became aware of what um, customer service was all about, mm. um, and the, the, the pressures and the benefits of, of working in a hospitality environment. So mm. hospitality's run through my blood since I was a very young child from mm. three. Um, so, um, it was a natural thing for me to want to move into the hospitality sector. Did I have existing clients? No, I didn't. Um, mm. and you know, I, and like everybody that work self-employed, I'm constantly out there looking for new contacts mm. and new business. Um, that's part of the challenge of, of working for yourself, of course. Mm. Mm. I mean, I mean, then the other point there that you mentioned, you know, when you do go off on your own, when you're doing something for yourself, you, you then have to do everything. So if mm. you don't know how to do customer service, you've got to learn if you don't know how to 
you know, do whatever, make spreadsheets, whatever it, it might yes. be. But you, you've got to you've got to learn that stuff, or yeah, yeah. or put it to one side and hope that you don't have to do it. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Like, yeah. Put your fingers in your ears. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, and I guess there are quite a few people that have that have gone down that way. And I think you know, going back to a question you you asked earlier about sort of the competitive nature. Uh, of, of certain my industry, but any industry really, it is about trying to differentiate yourself, trying to find ways in which you can be a little bit different from the competitors that are out there. And I think for me, um, it is about personality. It comes down to you know whether you like someone. And I, you know, I love what you said earlier about buy from people. Mm-hmm. And I think that's absolutely the case. I think if if you can empathise with your client and understand where they're coming from, I think mm-hmm. generally speaking, I do then I think that that goes a long way to building a successful um, relationship. And, uh, you know, I'm pleased to say that, you know, people that I work with come back to me for more work because, um, you know, we get on together and we like each other. Mm. And that's really important. I want to bring up the the projects you're working on at the moment now before we go into questions. And then okay. it, then it doesn't need to be explained if we kind of bring it up. Sure. So, yeah, if you want to tell us a little bit about that, because this is how I found out about you and what you're doing and it sounds like <laughs> yeah. an interesting project so uh, yeah what what's this project you're working on at the moment yeah so the project is a is what i call a passion project and what i mean by that is i'm not getting paid to do it <laughs> <laughs> um and it, it, it's called shooting chefs um and it came about um from uh, a, a quite a famous shoot from 1990 by one of my photography heroes i call bob carlos clark if you've not checked him out do so um his images are amazing but he did a shoot in 1990 for marco pierre white who was at that time putting together a book which ultimately became known as the white white heat book uh, and so this the subsequent photo shoot was also named white heat and the images are iconic if you think of marco pierre pierre white and you're in the hospitality sector you will almost certainly visualize it from one of the Bob Carlos Clark pictures. Mm. Um, and there are some iconic images of, uh, of Marco Pierre White. And I always wanted to emulate that really iconic black and white. And I think I said to you at the time we talked about this, um, I, 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 I hesitate to use the word gritty because I don't think that's really an appropriate word for, for mm. chefs. But it, it is that very sort of urban chic style that, mm. you know, that, that it, it's a very raw uh, style of photography that uh, that was used for white heat and i love it um it's a very open it's a very honest uh, depiction of what happens in the kitchen and i think going back to what we talked about earlier with the hospitality sector i think people forget sometimes exactly what goes in to making great food and uh, and creating a great atmosphere and so i wanted to capture that sort of behind the scenes look um, and so what I do is I go to work with photographers, uh, sorry, with chefs, and I tend to, to, to shoot for about an hour. And mm. typically the way that we do it is um, we do um, half an hour of the shoot is sort of the prep and getting ready for service. Mm. And then the last half of the shoot is the actual service itself. So mm. I capture a little bit of the preparation and then the, then the sort of the, the white heat, forgive me, of the service and, and how, the, how the kitchen starts to really fire up quite literally mm. um, in, 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 when people start placing their orders. I, I know you, you, were, you went and did a shoot yesterday. If you can talk about that, but I want you to kind of think about it in terms of if you can kind of compare that to the first one you did. Like <laughs> what, what are the kind of things that you've learned on this project like? What are the things that you're doing different now? Are you quite, do you know where to place yourself better? Are you, are you more out of the way or do you make you like, how does it work compared to how you started? What's the imagination versus reality kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, you can imagine, um, I think in any, uh, in any professional kitchen, um, you you know, typically you're going to have at least two people in there, possibly three or four, or maybe even more in bigger kitchens. Uh, and so placing yourself is absolutely vitally important because the last thing that you want to do as a photographer is be in the way. Mm-hmm. And there's two reasons for that really in a, in a professional kitchen. One is obviously don't want to get in the way of the chefs and the preparation of the food. And there's a lot of stuff going on and a lot of them are quite dangerous, you know, knives and, and all sorts of stuff going on. But also 
it, it interferes with the image. Um, mm. You know, it, it is very much, a, you know, I hesitate to use the word fly on the wall, phrase and fly on the wall, but it is certainly behind the scenes. And you don't want them to be aware of you. So the first part of the shoot that I talked about, actually, I'm just clicking away because I just want them to get used to me being there yeah. and get used to the idea of the camera firing off every so often. Um, but very quickly, once you've engaged with those chefs and you've talked to their staff and the, the brigade, then, it, you know, they settle into doing what they were doing. Then you can capture some genuine, real images. There are times when the uh, chefs will play up to the camera, of course. Um, and I can think of a couple of memorable examples, which I'm not going to mention because I wouldn't want to embarrass them. But, <laughs> you know, the, there were clearly images that were in. In some of the shoots where, you know, the, the, the chef decided that they wanted to pose or, mm. or, 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 or perform in a particular way. And we captured those, you know, I've, I, and I've, I've sent those to the chefs and said, you know, this is what you look like in, in your <laughs> kitchen. But yeah, the, it, it, it has changed a lot from the first shoot that I did, which was with a very talented um, young uh, chef called uh, Annabelle Day, who is a vegan uh, chef. and. She very kindly uh, offered an opportunity for me to, to, to go and photograph her at a uh, kitchen in Huddersfield. She's a Leeds-based chef, which is how I still, you know, keep it within that shooting yeah, chefs because yeah. it is about the lead chefs. But, but yeah, and bless her that, you know, she was really patient with me. That shoot probably took twice as long as they do today because I needed to kind of find my way around and, yeah, and understand yeah. how, how the shoot would work. Now it's, it comes much more naturally. Are you, is it all, are you shooting everything handheld then? Are you, you just kind of like, yes. like have some, yeah, because I was, yeah, I was absolutely, thinking I can't, absolutely. yeah, you can't really set up and <laughs> be locked no, off. No, and it's a good point. The tech, the tech, the, the techniques available um, are, are quite limited because you are ha having to be very conscious of lighting, mm. uh, reflective surfaces. I mean, they're, mm. you know, it's, it's a minefield for light. Mm. Um, and every kitchen, of course, is different. And the key to shooting chefs is, and the real challenge technically, is that what I want to produce are a series of images um, from different kitchens, you, different chefs, but all looking virtually the same. Mm. So that, you know, that they look, they're all black and white, of course, but they all look like the same style of image. So you could imagine when you look at the pictures that they were all shot in the same kitchen. Mm. And that presents real technical difficulties because, of course, every kitchen is different. The lighting in every kitchen is different. Some have lots of natural light. Some have no natural light at all. Um, the, the variety of lighting is very different in terms of whether it's fluorescent or halogen or, you know, tungsten or whatever they're using. Mm. And, you know, it, it changes. Um, a particular chef that I was shooting just recently had on their pass three lights um, that were heat light lamps to obviously mm. keep the food at least warm. And those heat lamps produced a really unusual color. And so when I was looking back at the photographs, when I got them back to, uh, to home, the, the color was completely different to the color that I remembered. Mm. Um, and that changed the whole perspective of the way that I, that I edited the image. Because mm. I don't know if you find it the same, like, but I always see it as you know you you look through a digital viewfinder or the monitor screen mm. that that's not going to be the image that you you get no, <laughs> no indeed indeed yeah absolutely you're absolutely right and again without going too technical i shoot in what we call raw as opposed to jpeg which is perhaps more familiar to people and raw captures all of the not all it captures all of the data but it also captures all of the information coming into the camera Mm. Uh, which makes it easier theoretically to edit it because you, you've got a lot more to play with. But that said, it's a challenge technically when you're working in different lighting conditions and, and you're right, you know, you look at the camera and you think that you can see how the, the weird thing is with shooting chefs is that I see in black and white and I know that sounds peculiar, mm. but, but that's how I see it. So mm. when I'm shooting for shooting chefs, I'm always thinking black and white. Mm. So I ignore all the colors mm. when you're shooting food professionally, of course, you know, you wouldn't tend to shoot in black and white. So mm. it's all about 
color and it's about the vibrancy of the color and the intensity of those colors mm. which often you know people eat with their eyes and the same is true with photography mm. um of food photography in particular but with shooting chefs it's all black and white so you've got to change your mindset and think in black and white mm. and light and contrast mm. yeah which i think is probably a very nice interesting challenge for you Mm, absolutely yeah. so it's yeah. a chain, change of how you would normally operate yeah so. i mean i'll be honest i think you know the shooting chefs project has actually produced some of the best photography i've ever produced i don't want to sound sort of narcissistic or um, you no, know, but you're allowed to appreciate your own work yeah it's like oh this is some of the uh, th i'm really impressed by myself yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> I, you know i look at i look at some photographs that i've taken particularly those sort of from the past, because I'm, I'm very much in the sort of the, the freshness of something, the, the, mm. the latest things that is the best thing in my, mm. often in my opinion. And when I look back at some of my photography, I think, yeah, okay, you know, it's all right. But when I look at shooting chefs, it, it, it fills me with joy. I look at it and I think, yeah, I really like that. that mm. That's, that's a nice photograph. And the feedback I've been getting from the chefs has been fantastic as well. So, mm. you know, I guess that's, that 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 uh, that goes a long way to making you feel better about life. Mm, I, I mean, I I thought it was great straight away because obviously doing this, I'm kind of like, oh yes, you're capturing work, and <laughs> it was like that. What a genius yeah. idea you had. That's a bit like <laughs> yeah. mine. <laughs> well, well, yeah. And in, in, interestingly, um, my A level <laughs> photography project. Of course, you have a you have to do a practical element to it, and that was actually my the subject was actually mm. work pho uh, mm. photography. So I, I went out and I took the, took photographs of people at work. Um, mm. I remember particular uh, one particular shot was of a blacksmith that I took, um, got an opportunity to, to, to do some photography for, for them. So, um, yeah, so I guess subconsciously, I've probably always enjoyed photographing people at work. Mm. I can imagine, I, I mean, how, A, how did you find a blacksmith for a start? And B, <laughs> I bet shooting that was amazing. Cause you must've got like the hammer bangs and sparks and oh, yeah. all of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I went proper, proper cliche. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, I think I did actually ask them to sort of heat up a bit yeah. of metal and give it a good bash so I could get the sparks. Um, yeah. Um, well, I grew up, as I say, I grew up on the Isle of Wight, um, which is both, a, um, a, you know, a hospital, very ho hospitality driven, yeah. uh, economy, but also, um, an agricultural, uh, economy. So, um, blacksmiths did, it did still exist. And I, I suspect probably still do. So, mm. uh, yeah, yeah, I was very fortunate, but. I did do some photographs of some guys digging up a road as well. That they they were less exciting photographs. <laughs> <laughs> if there are any blacksmiths in Leeds, please get in touch. Yes, now. yeah, I'd love to re <laughs> love to replicate my A level project. <laughs> well, it would just be amazing. I love that I'm being surprised by the kind of work that is going on in Leeds. So yeah, any of that. If if you're doing something weird and different, then yeah, definitely come and tell me about it. So I'm going to start off with the COVID question, just because I think it's a nice one to bring us back to the start of this decade. And just, I want to look at how it's, how, and if it's changed your work. If you think back to when we went into official lockdown, where were you at that point and how did that affect you? Was that, oh my God, all my jobs have gone, what, what on earth am I going to do? Or was it, you know, endlessly ringing clients and reassuring them like what what happened was it no work more work like how was it yeah it, it was incredibly tough and um i think it was tough for everybody i found it really tough and i think you know one of the things i will say about covid maybe taking a slight tangent i think it's been really useful to open up the conversation about mental health mm. um because i think people really did find it incredibly difficult. And I know I did. I, my mental health definitely suffered. And, you know, to answer the question bluntly, yes, it was almost impossible to run shoots. Um, if, even when um, you were masked up and, you know, doing social distancing, you know, it's just very, very difficult to do. And, uh, of course, a lot of the restaurants uh, were either shut uh, or, you know, were, were struggling and, and 
probably not open to the idea of uh, of hiring a photographer. So yeah, it was very, very tough. And it was very tough for the hospitality sector generally, uh, and still is, you know, the repercussions of COVID are, are still being felt today. And you know, I think it's important for people to bear in mind that, you know, we had the, the eat out to help out um, scheme at the very beginning of it, which, you know, is coming under a lot of criticism, I guess, in recent years, but, um, you know, it, it, it really did hit the hospitality sector very hard. Mm. And I think, you know, still, we still feel the, the, the repercussions of it really. Mm. I get the sense that, you know, although we're opened up kind of thing, mm. I get the sense that a lot of, especially that sector, you know, they just haven't got back to where they were before. No, no, I don't think they have. And I think, um, in some ways, maybe there's been a slight change in culture as well. I think, you know, people, I think we've always been quite, um, a country that's always sort of focused on, um, going out and enjoying ourselves. And I think sometimes people forget that the hospitality industry makes life enjoyable for people. Mm. You know, it, it really does. You know, we are social creatures and the hospitality industry provides a social environment for us to enjoy our lives. Mm. But yeah, it's been incredibly difficult. And I think people have changed their habits to some extent. You know, when I talk to restaurateurs and, and chefs, you know, I think they are still feeling the benefit, that's in, feeling the pain, sorry, mm. of, of COVID. And I think it was a harsh lesson. Um, for the hospitality industry and, and indeed for the rest of the, you know, for every industry sector, really. Mm. And it's changed culturally our society. I think, you know, working from home now is perhaps more acceptable than it used to be. We've changed our way of doing things, I think. Um, mm. Some of those are good, um, like the fact that we've opened up about mental health. Um, but, you know, in other areas, it's, it's still very painful. Mm. I think as well in the mental health area, you know, the, the kind of well-being and work-life balance kind of areas of, you know, people were forced to consider that separation of work and life, especially when their work's plunged into their own home, their own bedroom or something. It's like, yeah, yeah. well, where is work? Where, yes. where, does, where, where does life start? <laughs> where does work start? And yeah, is there yeah. any separation? So I'm going to, I'm going to speculate here again. So, you know, obviously, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but am I right in thinking that as we kind of 21 was probably a bit of in and out of, you know, like some work, some opening yes. up and then 22 was like, I've got loads of work, but now I've got, <laughs> but then later in the year, now I've got loads of bills. <laughs> was, was it, was it kind of some of that? Cause th that's kind of my experience of you know sort of through lockdown was like started to open up and then before you knew it, it was kind of oh we're we seem to be back to normal ish but then also that brought a lot of chaos with it like was that yeah i think yeah i think i think that was certainly like that for me and i think it was like that for a lot of other people and um i think you know it's as i said the the repercussions of 2019 2020 um, will, will be felt for quite some time. And yeah, yeah. Um, and I still don't think we're entirely normal. I was, I was listening to somebody earlier this morning and they was, they were saying, you know, we, we've become a little bit complacent about COVID because it hasn't gone away. It's mm. still there. Mm. Um, it's still putting some people in hospital. Thankfully it's, you know, it, it, it in much lower numbers than it used to. Uh, and the severity is perhaps less than it was but it's still highly contagious and it can still make you feel really poorly. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know whether you've experienced it. I've had, I've had COVID. Mm. Um, I, I lost two members of my family, um, mm -hmm. in the early days of, of COVID. So, you know, it's a horrible, horrible thing. And we, we, we shouldn't be too complacent about it, but we also need to learn to live with it. And, and we will probably be living with it for some considerable period of time. I'm guessing. Mm. Has Brexit had any effects on your work? Directly, no, I, I wouldn't have said it has, but of course, again, you know, it has affected the hospitality industry uh, and, you know, we see the results of that in that, um, you know, it's, it's increasingly difficult to find staff mm. for the hospitality industry. If you follow any of the social media platforms that, you know, are, are directed towards the hospitality sector, 
um, Leeds, Bar, Leeds Bar Grafters, for example, on Facebook, you know, the, the, pretty much every post is somebody saying we need to find some staff. Mm. Um, and there are all sorts of issues around that, but Brexit certainly has a major part to play because mm. it has changed the way that people work. Perhaps it's fair to say that some of the people that would have worked in the hospitality industry would have come from other parts of Europe. Mm. Um, and obviously, you know, the, that that resource has, has dried up to some extent. Yes. And yeah, so I think indirectly, no, it hasn't really. Indirectly, yes, I think it has had an impact. It certainly had an impact on the economy, but I agree, you know, the risk of sounding rather sort of, you know, uh, like everybody else that you've spoken to, uh, you know, it is difficult to, to, to separate Brexit and COVID, I think. There, there is probably an argument COVID sort of helped to um, negate the issues over Brexit, you know, the, all the things that we were told were going to happen with Brexit mm. probably didn't happen in quite the same way because mm. of COVID. Mm. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely impacted on the, uh, on the hospitality sector. Mm. Yeah. Like, I mean, it would be interesting to see a world in which we had Brexited, but that not been COVID. <laughs> yes. Because it'd be like, Hmm. I wonder what the discourse would be like now. Let's do social media. Uh, we've, mm. touched, we've touched upon this a little bit, but I think it, we can probably go into this a little bit deeper with you because obviously so much of social media is image mm. um, and video now. So my question here is like, how has it changed your work? How much time do you need to spend on social media? Mm. And do you actually feel that that time is is useful and valuable and it gives you a return that you can see that's tangible or do you just feel like it's something that you've got to do because it's expected and it's kind of like oh what do i do like, <laughs> how's, how's your relationship to social media how's it changed your work and how yeah, does it, that kind of come into your to your working like did you take to it straight away or was it kind of something you were resistant to for a bit so I've always had a love-hate relationship with social media, and I think mm. that's probably true of a lot of people. Um, and I think it also very much depends on the platforms we're referring to. I mean, if we, mm. if, if for example, we want to sort of break it out a little bit, you know, I can't stand Twitter because I just mm. find it an incredibly toxic environment, and you know, it's just somewhere I don't want to go. Right? I have, I think I have got a, a Twitter account. Yet I've got a couple, I think, but. You know, I don't use them for that very reason. I just find it so very toxic. And I, I, the only reason I have them, I think, is because back in the day, I was told, you know, you really ought to have one. So Twitter, I think, you know, is, it, it is a toxic environment that I want to stay well clear of. Mm. Instagram has changed a lot um, mm. because it's become part of the meta universe. And I, in my own personal opinion is that that's changed it for the worse. I think it's less creative today and more kind of spam and, uh, you know, at commercial. And I think that's, a, that's a great shame. Um, I used to have, um, a, an account on there. I, I still have accounts because again, you know, as you rightly say, it is very much image driven and all photographers ought to have an account on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Um, but I had my own private one, which I used for posting my own sort of, you know, more creative images. I, I closed it down because I just got fed up with the, you know, the, the whole kind of spam and people mm. constantly trying to steal information off you or corrupt mm. your account or, you know, what have you. So uh, it was very, very uh, annoying. Facebook actually has been quite useful for me, but it only in terms of the groups. So I mentioned the group earlier, for example, Leeds Bar Grafters which is a tremendous site for the hospitality industry. Mm. Uh, a lot of really cooperative individuals on there talking and sharing information and help and advice. And that's a useful form of networking, if you like. LinkedIn, of course, you know, it's, it's classified, I think, as social media, but it's obviously mm. focused around business. And that's a huge influence on my business. Um, and it's an, an amazing way for me to, to build relationships with people going back to what we talked about earlier, you know, it is all about people. And so I find that, you know, very, very useful in terms of whether you make money out of social media. You know, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I always used to say the only people that made money out of social media were social media people. Mm. 
And I think that's still true to a large extent. Um, I think there's an awful lot of misinformation out there. Some of it very harmful, but of course, also some of it just general nonsense, mm. you know, just people promoting themselves as gurus that really aren't, um, <laughs> they're, they're just full of their own self-importance. Um, mm. So, yeah, I, I, I still probably in answer to the question, I probably still have a love a relationship with who is social media, but it does depend on the platform. I absolutely hate Twitter. <laughs> mm. If that didn't yeah. come across earlier. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I feel the same. I wasted far too much of my life on it yesterday. And I, it was one of those things I went on just to go on and yeah. then lost loads of time and just spouted loads of nonsense. And it's like, why am I doing this to myself? <laughs> <laughs> I think the worry, the worry for me is, um, and this is a more general thing about media, I guess, in general, is that there's so much stuff out there now that it's difficult to know what, what is and what isn't truthful. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the problem. Um, I don't know what the solution to that is. Um, it takes somebody far more intelligent than me to figure it out. Um, but freedom of speech is, is so vitally important to society generally. But where do you draw the lines? I guess the, the challenge, isn't mm -hmm. it? You know, it's, you know, do you keep on listening to idiots? and bigots um, mm. uh, um, and, and can you silence them in a way that is fair and appropriate mm. or do we have to put up with them? I, you know, I don't know the answer to that question, but I certainly choose not to use Twitter for that very reason. I want to briefly touch upon LinkedIn. I've probably had a LinkedIn since like 2007, 2008. Never yeah. really used it for anything other than occasionally look at job adverts or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And then about 2018, 19, I started using it a bit more. And then as we went into lockdown, it, it seemed to become like a, a real social media site. People were getting work, were building work, were building connections and doing things. Mm -hmm. Was that your kind of experience with LinkedIn? Because you said it was kind of important. Is that something that's built in importance just in the last few years? Yeah, I think absolutely. And I think you're, you're absolutely right. I think the last couple of years, um, maybe three years now, um, it, it's become increasingly important to business. Mm. And I think um, it probably has a lot to do with COVID. Interestingly, there's been quite a few debates on LinkedIn about what is and what isn't appropriate to post. Mm. Um, and I think the definition of that now has changed quite a bit. People do post stuff on there that you wouldn't perhaps normally have done. Mm. Um, and again, it goes back to sort of the conversation we had earlier about mental health. You know, I'm noticing now a lot of people that I'm connected to who are starting to open up about their challenges and, mm. and, and the issues that they face in their business. And I think one of the interesting things about business generally is that at one time, I think it was all about making money. It was all about, you know, how successful we are, you know, mm. we've got record profits and we're doing this and we're doing that, we're doing the other. And I feel, and I may be wrong, but I feel that there's been a shift towards what we used to call sort of corporate social responsibility, mm -hmm. you know, where people are starting to think, actually, you know, we should be paying back in some way. We should be mm -hmm. doing something more than we were doing mm -hmm. just by generating income for ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether that's true. I don't know whether whether that's just my take on things, but I think people have become a little bit more socially responsible, um, from a business point of view um, mm. and recognizing, you know, you touched on earlier about the, the, um, lifestyle, um, about the, the balance between work and life. Mm. I think people are starting certainly on an individual level, whether it's happening at a corporate level, I don't know, but on an individual level, I think people are starting to pay much more attention to that work life balance. And I read just recently, for example, has been quite a big experiment. Um, you've probably come across it where companies have started working on a four day week. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's a really interesting concept. Of course, if we go back, you know, hundreds of years, it was typically a six day week with Sunday being the only day that people had. And then thanks to the sort of people like the Tom Pub Martyrs, we, we ended up getting a full weekend and mm. I suspect in the future, we will probably move towards a four or even maybe a three day week, but, mm. um, you know, that's, that 
that that will present its own challenges in terms of productivity, I guess, you know, um, I don't know whether that answers your question. No, yeah. no, I think that's a really good answer. And from what I've seen of the four day week, like it seems to have gone really well. And this whole idea, like, you know, when we talk about progress and, and so on, it's like progressing what to wear. And <laughs> if we're talking about work, then surely it should not be working all the hours in the world. It should be a reduction in hours, you know, more quality time, more lifetime, more, mm. um, you know, so that we we don't spend all our hours working. Surely that would make sense, especially in an age where every hour we're working, we're burning calories, fossil fuels, you know, like we need to be doing less of it, in my thinking. Yes, yeah. So, um, I mean, it's like with democracy, it's this sort of thing as if there's an end point. It's like, no, the the the, the narrative of democracy has been an extension of the, you know, of the, uh, what am I thinking, of, of suffrage of the mm. franchise mm. and that why does that why does that end with you marking an x on a piece of paper we should go further we should have more power we should be more democratic you know? mm. do absolutely. more democracy not less yes absolutely yeah yes yeah. yeah and i guess i guess social media to some extent plays a part in that democratization um or, you know, people now feel whether rightly or wrongly and whether it's true or not, they feel like they've got more of a voice mm. um, in society. And I think, you know, that's got to be a good thing. And I certainly would like to see more um, direct interaction with the powers that be, whoever they are, you know, be it government or local government or, you know, whatever. But I... Uh, I would like to see that. I'm I'm a big fan. I mean, get back in going back to the the conversation about Brexit. One of the things that I thought was great about that was that it was down to the people to make that decision. And you know, I'd like to see a bit more of that. Really, yeah. Um, you know, it, it would be interesting. You know, there are there are regular campaigns um, on various topics on social media. Some of which now are becoming part of mainstream politics, mm. you know, the, the, where you can vote on whether you think something is right or wrong. And, the, mm. and I think, is it a hundred thousand um, petition? Yeah, the yeah. government, the, the government have committed to starting to sort of take notice of those. So mm. I think that's a really interesting idea. You know, again, it's open to, to corruption and, and, and mismanagement, I guess, but you mm. know, I'd like, I would definitely like to see social media evolve into some sort of far more democratic process and be involved with democracy more um, mm. so that people can genuinely have an opinion and um, influence the way things are done in this country mm. and in the wider world, of course. Mm. And get practiced at democracy because, you know, if you don't practice something, you're not good at it. And like <laughs> doing doing every four years is not practice. It's not you know, because most people don't get involved in their local community or don't, you know, like. No, 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 no. And again, you know, if we, if we talk about Brexit, um, you know, whatever side of the fence you sit on in terms of whether it's a good or a bad thing, you know, the fact of the matter is that a lot of people that voted to remain in the EU never voted in any EU election. Mm. Um, you know, and you think, well, you know, where was the democracy there? You know, you, you're, you're effectively, you know, pushing the, the power to a, a, a body of people that you have no control over whatsoever. Mm. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's a strange one, isn't it? But, you know, I think, I think the idea of giving people more power mm. has got to be a good thing as mm. so long as it's managed in the right way. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And. Again, I'm going to leave that there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, went a bit heavy there. <laughs> no, no, that, that, I, I mean, it's good. Uh, like I could, you know, again, we could discuss on this point alone for, for longer. Sure. Um, but yeah, I'm going to move on to the next question. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do climate change. Well, so, uh, <laughs> how has, or, or has it, how has climate change affected? your work and is there anything in your work that you can do in terms of awareness raising adaptation mitigation i used to ask people if it's even a concern 
but I haven't had a single person who's been <laughs> like, I don't believe in climate change. <laughs> so I don't even believe those people exist anymore. No. I think that's a media invention. Yeah, yes. But there's no, flat, in fairness, there are flat earthers. So yes. there, there, there might be some. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I mean, like, how does it affect your work? Is it a concern? Is it even on your radar? Or like, yeah it, yeah, it is. And it has to be, doesn't it? I mean, I, I think, you know, one of the things that I'm conscious of is that, you know, I use technology, the technology that I have on my camera, you know, it's very smart. It's, it's got chips in it. And those chips are manufactured um, somewhere, probably in China, uh, using minerals that are being mined out of you know, out of the ground. And yeah, of course, you know you have to think about those things. And you know it, it's a bit like the electric car argument. And I, I have a bit of uh, an issue with electric cars because that whilst they don't have uh, emissions, that they're, they're not burning fossil fuels, they're not um, emitting. Uh, toxic fumes, as our other vehicles are, they're no more or less uh, environmentally friendly than the normal car. In fact, there's an argument that would say, well, what happens to the batteries, for example, mm. when they can no longer be used? You know, what are we going to do with all these batteries? Mm. The other argument, I think, the other the other issue with something like that is, you know, the, the demands that it's now putting on the energy grid. You know. It, it, must there, there must be an issue there. Uh, so environmental issues are very important. What I do in terms of my day-to-day -day activity, I don't know what more I can do than I'm already trying to do. Mm. Um, I'm, you know, much more passionate about recycling and, and, and I'm much more aware of my carbon footprint, but I think it's fair to say that my carbon footprint would be quite low mm. um, because I don't, produce, you know, going back to the conversations we were having earlier about analog photography, mm. um, I don't use film, which mm. is a, you know, is a byproduct of the petrochemicals industry. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, there's lots of chemicals involved in developing film and mm -hmm. prints. I don't use paper because my, my work now is predominantly digital and, and therefore, you know, electronic. Mm. Um, so. You know, there's, there's all those environmental issues. I mean, if we went back to film and paper photography, there'd be a whole debate, I'm sure, around the environmental impact of the chemicals that are being used. Yeah. Um, you know, without getting too technical, it all relies on silver, um, you know, in one way, shape or form. And silver obviously is a mineral that has to be mined. Mm. So, you know, with, I, with mercury. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. So, you know, I think, you know, in the broadest sense, photography has moved in the right direction from, mm. from an environmental point of view. Yeah. We've got microchips in our cameras. Personally, I, and I always have this argument, I would love my camera to be a lot simpler than it is. I don't really want it to be as sophisticated as it is. Mm. And it probably does a dozen things that I will never use. Yeah. Okay, so I've got two questions for you specifically here on this. Mm. So the, the first question is, does, or should I ask the second question? And have I already forgotten it? I'm going to ask the first question first, <laughs> and then the other one will come back if it does. So do you feel that you work cleaner now? I mean, just that from that discussion with the chemicals and so on, do you feel that the job of photography is a cleaner process now? Does it feel, I guess, healthier? Yes, I, th yes. I think abs absolutely. Um, uh, for the reasons that I've just mentioned about the, 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 the lack of chemicals in processing of film and, uh, mm. and um, the, the, the final print, mm. I'm sure there are things that we could do better um, mm. as there are in any industry. One of the worst things about my industry, uh, the photographic business, is that we are, uh, and I think this is true of most photographers, we love buying stuff. Mm. Um, you know, we, we buy new camera bodies, we mm. buy new lenses mm. and we're forever buying new stuff. Mm. Um, it is a very kind of keeping up with the Joneses kind of thing. You know, mm. I, I, you know, the risk of plugging the company, I use, um, Fuji cameras, mm. uh, Fuji cameras are constantly bringing out new versions of the camera I use, mm -hmm. um, and bringing out newer and better, allegedly the variants of their lenses. My argument would be there comes a point where it's actually very difficult to differentiate between mm. a, a particular piece of kit and another piece of upgraded version. 
Mm. Um, so, so I think from a, from a photography manufacturing perspective, I would much rather see them cutting back on the developments of, uh, of new kit, but that could be said of any industry, you know, I mean, how often do we upgrade our, our mobile phones? You know, I, my mobile phone is now three years old. I keep getting reminders from my provider mm. to upgrade it. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, actually, why would I, it, you know, it it's works, yeah. it, it's working. I don't need to upgrade it. So I'm not going to. So yeah, in answer to your question, I think photography's moved on tremendously. We don't use the chemicals we used to use. That's great. Could we do better? Yeah, of course we could. Um, by one thing, we, one thing the industry could do is stop upgrading kit for the sake of it. Or circularity. So that would, the, the second question would be like, how much of your kit can you kind of send back to be taken apart? Like, yeah, the, the kind of full life cycle consideration. So I've talking, uh, I've talking, I've spoken to, <laughs> <laughs> I've spoken to a couple of people, uh, last year who are involved in passive house, which. So like really high standard insulation building, really good building, something mm. moving towards. But one of the things that they consider is the whole life cycle. So within the design of the product of the house, they're considering the taking it apart as well. And mm. I think for something like for your industry, where I think it is like, it isn't on photographers to just stop buying enough kit. It's like saying to artists, like, well, just make do with less paint, you know, <laughs> less brushes. It's like, this is my kit. Like, this is how yeah. I express myself. This is, yeah. This is, so I think yeah. you need that, but you need, if something's going to be updated every five minutes, it should go back and be, you know, those parts should be reused, reassembled and upgraded. Yeah. And, yeah, and I think, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And there's certainly not enough of that happening at the moment. There is, um, there is a great secondhand market in the photography mm. industry, mm. um, and that's very healthy. And, um, I applaud that. I mean, I, you know, at the risk of going into too much detail, I've, I think I've got two of the lenses that I use on a regular basis are both used lenses mm. that I bought from other people. So rather than directly from the manufacturer. So yes, I think, you know, definitely we could recycle. Um, mm. equipment, um, uh, and you know, whether that's just simply by reselling it on, um, mm. or as you say, breaking it down and, and building new stuff from the component parts, mm. that's definitely something that should be happening, but that should also be happening across every industry sector, of mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. Um, absolutely. Mm. And I suppose even though like, you know, they have a, they have a market incentive to keep producing and to keep adding new gadgets and so on. But they also, as far as I can tell, again, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I get the sense that cameras are still built to last, you know, like they're not yeah. built to kind of, oh, well, this will be out of warranty in two to three years and then it'll be redundant because we'll fill it, you know, it's chips full of too much data. Or yes. Whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but again, that also still goes back to the technology argument, doesn't it? You know, um, it, it, the more technology you put into something, the more redundant it's likely to become at some point. Um, and the, there is a thing in the technology industry called uh, built-in redundancy, mm. um, and particularly mobile phones, mm. um, where, you know, they don't expect them to last. So you, you've heard of universal basic income mm. before. Yeah. So if that was a thing how do you think that might change your work would you kind of sit back and work less or would you throw yourself into things that you didn't need to get paid for more or uh, yeah how how would it change things for you do you think uh, firstly i'd say i think it's a great idea and i know it was talked about quite a lot at the beginning of covid covid and of course we had the the um rishi sunak bless him um, brought about the um, furlough scheme, which many thought might potentially lead towards uh, a universal basic income. Mm. In answer to the question, I think I'd probably work a lot harder because it would take the pressure off in terms of having to do the business development aspect. Mm. I could spend a lot more time working with charities and charitable organizations who need promotions, mm. um, who often can't afford to use photographers. So uh, yeah, the, the simple answer is, I think it's a great idea in principle. I think it would be very complicated to implement 
you know, again, it would require some great minds to, um, to, to come up with a way of making it work that didn't adversely affect productivity because, you know, whether we like it or not, you know, we do have to admit that the UK economy is less productive than it ought to be. Mm. And there are all sorts of reasons which we probably don't want to go into here, but you know, it, the danger with UBI would be that it could lead to a drop in productivity. But for me, for me, no, I think, you know, I would absolutely relish the opportunity mm. to uh, get out there and do a lot more work, uh, for free. Mm. Um, and supporting the sort of things that I want to support. You know, I'm mm. passionate about animal welfare, for example. I'd love to be able to provide my services to animal charities to help promote them. Um, and I would love to do that free of charge. Mm. But I have mortgages and bills to pay. And, you know, you know, you just cut, there's a limit to how much you can give away, essentially. Yeah. 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 So, the question here is, if you could change any three things about your work, so anything at all, um, mm. so you can be realistic or totally fantastical here. So if you could change anything about your three things about your work right now, what would you change? I think I've just touched on it really. Um, I'd like to spend a lot more time working with people who perhaps need to promote their business or their organization without having to worry about the cost of that. I'd love the hospitality industry to embrace uh, photography more than they have done. Although, as I said earlier, they, they, they have embraced it. Um, so I'd like to sort of help to educate people, I suppose, in the value of photography, mm -hmm. um, in, in a business environment. Um, and I think the third thing, again, you know, we've, we've touched on it is that consumerism that, you know, let, let's not, you know, keep updating kits, you know. Mm -hmm. The camera I use today is a brilliant camera. It does a really good job. It's a workhorse camera. I don't ever need really to change it unless I break it. But there are a lot of photographers out there that as soon as a new piece of kit comes on the market, they're, they're rushing out there. And, you know, again, tying it back to the social media thing, if you go on YouTube, you'll see loads of photographers that are always talking about the latest piece of kit. and They're really kind of promoting it, pushing it. And people buy into that, you know, if you're constantly mm. being bombarded by, uh, you know, it's different to, you know, car advertising, for example, because I don't think people, even petrol heads don't get really passionate about the latest mod, uh, certainly not from the point of view of going out and buying it, because mm. obviously it's ridiculously expensive. Whereas a camera, camera lens isn't mm. that expensive in the grand scheme of things. Mm. So, um, you know, people will sort of go, wow, there's a new lens. I'll go and buy it, you know, mm. and I think, so if I could change anything about my industry would be that, you know, constant upgrading of, mm. of kit, basically. Do you think, like, would a tool library be useful, like a lens library? Yeah. That's a really like, interesting. You know, if there was a bunch of photographers who are like, right, well, I, but then it's your babies, isn't it? It's kind of like, <laughs> yeah. well, you're going to take my lens and use it and I'm not going to be there. Do you know how much I spent yeah. on that lens? <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, funnily enough, um, just a sort of a, a, a little sort of a, an aside, really, a, a very good friend of mine who is a very technical photographer. He's, mm. He really understands the technical stuff far better than I do, even though I, I was educated and trained in it. And he's kept up to speed with stuff that I've perhaps let go by the wayside to some extent, because you probably gathered by now that new trends don't particularly impress me. Mm. And I think, you know, he, he was using a particular type of equipment uh, for a long time. When I told him what camera I was getting, he was like, well, oh, I don't know why you're doing that. You know, that's not, he's now bought the same camera and he swapped out all of his old kit for, for this whole new ecosystem of, of of cameras. And so we've talked regularly about, well, you know, he wants to buy a particular lens that I may have. So mm. uh, I'll say to him that, you know, by all means, borrow it, you know, go, mm. go shoot some shots with it and see what you think. So going back to your question, uh, to, to your question, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, borrowing equipment is a great idea. Mm. And again, sort of taking full circle when I worked in the retail environment, 
because I'm conscious that I almost have contradicted myself by just saying that that's where I started out. Um, we did actually have a higher department. So, mm. um, and a lot of photographers back in the day, and I suspect still will go to companies. And there's a company here in, in, uh, in Leeds mm. that has a higher department. So you can go and hire the lenses or the equipment. The problem I think with that is that you really need to, to use a piece of kit for a fair period of time to really get mm. the grips with it. But yeah, it, it, certainly a, some sort of a library of equipment would be a great idea. And I might just actually scribble that down if you don't mind. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Note to sell. <laughs> Okay, so that's that's basically the end of my question. So we're at the point where I'm going to throw it over you to kind of discuss anything that you'd like to discuss. Feel free to kind of bring up anything that we've already covered and kind of dive back into it. Uh, mm. First of all, I'm going to ask for socials. So if you can tell people where to find you and where to find out about Shooting Chefs. Yeah, um, so I have a, an Instagram account, which is just Simon Robertson Photography. Um, dead easy to find. My website is Simon Robertson Photograph Simon Robertson dot photography. Um, so that's also very easy, and, and that's really it. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, of course, as we said earlier. So if anybody wants to go and look at the LinkedIn page, that would be fantastic. Um, I always connect with people because um, you never know where those conversations are going to lead to. Yeah. Um, I love working with people. You know, I think that's a great thing about what I do. Um, mm -hmm. It is very much a people-based uh, industry and business that I'm involved in, particularly because of the hospitality side of it. Um, and I, I love meeting new people and talking to new people. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I welcome all those kind of visits. The Shooting Chefs Project is something that's in development, obviously. It's an ongoing program. Mm -hmm. You and I talked about this before. Um, the intention ultimately is to run an exhibition. Mm -hmm. So if there's anybody out there listening to this that has exhibition space that mm -hmm. would be of interest um, in hosting a photographic exhibition, um, that would be really interesting. I'd really be interested to hear about that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I'm wanting to do an exhibition. I'd like to publish a book at some stage in the future based on the Shooting Chefs project. Uh, at the moment, the Shooting Chefs project is focused around Leeds. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a Leeds photographer. Um, I've lived in Leeds now, although you can tell from my accent, not originally from here, but I've lived here for over 30 years and I love the city um, and the people in the city. And I know that sounds a bit corny and cliche, but it happens to be true. Mm. You know, if, if you've lived and worked in London as I did for many years, <laughs> you appreciate what Leeds is like in comparison with London. So, yeah, that's, that's the intention with shooting chefs at some stage to produce a book. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing it. I quite like to talk about the future a little bit. Mm. Uh, well, I'd like to talk about your your kind of how how much you work. Like, are you a kind of workaholic, work as many hours as you can get kind of person, or are you like, I want to work this much so I get this much and I can live this much? And you know, are you much more like? This will give me this, which will give me this. Or you're just like, get all the money, get it, get it now before it runs out. <laughs> uh, no, not at all. Um, I think, you know, I, I work in a creative environment and I, you know, I love what I do. Would I like to do more of it? Absolutely. Of course mm -hmm. I would, but not for necessarily for financial, but just because I love doing what I do. So work-life balance is important to me. I have a very supportive wife and that's very important to me. I, um, you know, I value friends and family very much. Um, and as I said earlier, you know, I think maybe a four day working week is a great idea, um, mm. going forward for the future. I do have some concerns about that from a, a globe sort of, you know, a, a UK wide economy perspective, because, you know, we would still need to, to be productive and successful as a country. Um, but I believe it's possible to have a four day week and still do that. Mm. Um, work's always been kind of flexible for me, really. Um, I'm quite happy and often because of the work I do shoot outside of, um, normal office hours, whatever those are. Yeah. Um, do you work so weekends work, as well? Yeah. Like evenings required, and weekends. Or, yeah. Yeah. Evenings and weekends are typically where I do a lot of my work. Mm. Um, so, and I've no issue with that whatsoever. Um, mm. it, it, in some ways that's, you know, it just works better for the hospitality industry that mm. way. 
Um, so no, I, you know, it, it isn't about chasing the dollar anymore for me. I, and I suppose I'm lucky enough that I'm of a certain age where, you know, I don't feel that I need to do that as much as I used to. I mean, that said, the cost of living crisis is, uh, is pretty scary. <laughs> and, you know, I think may, maybe my attitude will change when I'm paying six, seven thousand pounds a year in gas and electricity. I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's a scary prospect, isn't it? Mm. Or you won't be doing that and you'll just be, you know, burning wood in, <laughs> in a <laughs> corner of my yeah. house. <laughs> Gives us another yeah. floor, but <laughs> Yes, yeah, chuck us, chuck us another chair. Oh. I, I mean, it, you know, it's easy to be flippant, I guess, isn't it? But I mean, it, it is a really scary thing. Um, mm. And, you know, if we talk about the future, which is sort of how you started the conversation, you know, it is really scary. I think the whole situation in Ukraine is horrible. Um, I think Putin is clearly waging an economic war as much as he is mm. a, a physical military war. I also am very worried that he's holding out for the long game. Mm. Um, I think his initial plan probably was to take over Ukraine very quickly. Mm. That obviously didn't happen, but I think he now feels that he's just going to hold out until the West whatever the West is, stop believing in the, the future of the Ukraine and stop supporting them. And I think that will be a very dangerous time for us. Um, but he's definitely using an economic uh, weapon against the rest of the world, really. Mm. And, and it's really quite worrying. I, I, I have a particular dislike of the sort of the global power um, that exists at the moment. And I think it's quite corrupt, mm. um, and, you know, quite scary in some ways. Uh, you know, I, I, I read recently that, you know, if you think about the energy companies, I was t- listening to an article just recently on a, on a podcast and it was about, um, the supply of energy from Russia and how it's. The, the, the energy is now being sent to India and to China and, and Europe is now buying their energy from these other sources, mm. but it's still actually coming from Russia. Mm. Uh, you know, it's just through the back door. We're now mm. paying more for the energy that we would have bought anyway. Mm. You know, it's the same, it's the same gas. It's mm. just costing us a lot, lot more money because of what's going on with the Ukraine. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what the solutions are, um, but yeah, I feel, I, I, I do worry. And I, and I think, you know, we also touched on technology. I also worry about um, artificial intelligence, not least of which, because it will have an impact on the photography industry. And, you know, if, if you can ask a computer to create an image for you, there will come a point where photography may not be necessary anymore. It may be that, a, that an artificial intelligence computer will be able to generate an image that will be every bit as good as, uh, as a photograph. And well, then don't you think that there'll be people who, there'll be people who set themselves up as like AI askers of like, all oh, right, so I will create the AI image that you need. I know how to talk to the AI, <laughs> how to get it, the right thing out of it. It's like, oh yeah. yes, I'll give you money. <laughs> yeah. that, yeah. that, I could see that happening. Like, honestly, I can see that. Oh, for sure. For sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah. It, Someone I think, will always find a way to make a job out of something. I think. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and money, of course, as well. Mm. And, you know, and it's a bit like you know, the conversation we had earlier about social media. And I flippantly mm. said, you know, the people that make money out of social media are people that make social media, mm. you know. Um, but I think AI is a worry because it is already starting to create art. And that's great, you know, because all art forms should progress. Mm. The worry for me would be at what point does a computer, you know, a computer is just doing an algorithm. It's Mm. it's just crunching ones and zeros and Mm. coming up with some kind of a result. Mm. The argument of whether that's art or not is is clearly debatable. But, you know, it, it does worry me that, computers will at some point be able to take better photographs than I can. <laughs> you know, I think it's inevitable that, that will happen. Um, mm. Whether it happens in my lifetime or not is, I, I, I doubt, to be perfectly honest, I certainly hope not, um, but I could see it. Mm. 
Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, you know, I think you've mentioned the other key point there in in terms of the energy. Like, it's all well and good, all is you know, extrapolate into the future of oh, these marvelous things are going to happen, or that's going to happen. It's like, is it? Mm. Where's where's the energy going to come from? Because mm. you're not going to get it from fossil fuels because it's running out for a start, and mm. also you can't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's. Uh, I feel it's incomplete when people run away with these like visions of the future and all it's going to be like this. It's like, you have no idea what it's going to be like, because Mm. we have no idea what's going to happen. Like we literally don't now, like it could, could be anything. Yeah. 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 Which is, um, yeah. Which I suppose. Scary in its own way. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or exciting, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think, you know, people say about, we talked about the environment, people say about, you know, science. I, I have a lot of faith in science because I think ultimately necessity is the mother of all invention. I think, you know, there, there are scientists working on ways in which we can improve our situation and our, and our environment. And there's some very clever stuff being done. We talked about electric, or I talked about electric cars. Um, you know, I think hydrogen fuels um, are going to be um, a big thing in the next sort of 10, 15 years. Once we've figured out how to stop things exploding, you know, <laughs> nobody wants a car that's going to explode, but you know, hydrogen is a great alternative energy source, um, mm. zero, zero carbons and relatively environmentally friendly to, to create, although there are some challenges around it, as I don't understand it, but you know, I think technology will make life better in some ways, but it will also impact negatively in others. Um, mm. That's just the nature of it. That's, we've learned that right the way through man's development. You know, if you read any of the books on, uh, on human development, it's always been the case that as new technology comes about, there are some great advantages and it also presents some new challenges. Mm. Um, you know, a few years ago, we talked about um, genetic modification of food. Mm. Now that's a reality. It's happening now. They don't call it genetic modification anymore. It's, it's a whole new kind of area of development, but mm. it's happening. And, and unfortunately or fortunately, it's, it's got to be the future of food production because we can't, af- we can't find the land to actually produce the food that we need for our growing population. Mm. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. It's, it's amazing the kind of worms that you can open just from starting off with this. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm going to ask a flippant question because I want to get it in there. Um, sure. Do you get to do, do you get to eat any of the food, or is it largely <laughs> inedible at that point because you've been putting lights on it and everything? Yeah, yeah. well, <laughs> yeah, and it's it, it's really interesting. Yes, you know, so the short answer is yes, um, and it is a perk of the job. I and mean, again, going back to why I got into hospitality. You know, I, I like my food, mm. um, you know, I like nice food. So, um, you know, yes, that is a perk of the job, but there is also an, a very serious point actually attached to that. And that is food waste, um, mm. you know, and, and it is a concern of mine and it's something I talk to my clients about, um, mm. you know, how do you successfully promote a dish without causing wastage? Mm. Um, the, the, one of the simplest answers is I'll eat it, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is, which goes down well sometimes. Um, but you know, I mean, at the end of the day, you're, you know, it is a serious point. You know, if say, for example, I'm working with a chef who's produced a piece of Wagyu beef, mm. which we all know is very expensive and, mm. you know, um, not for waste. If it takes me, you know, an hour to photograph it, you know, is it going to be edible at the end of it? Mm. you know what and what do we do with it if that is the case so it, it is a serious issue um, I, I don't know the answer to it really um, I work very closely with my uh, with the chefs that I work with to avoid as much wastage as possible which means really photographing it very quickly <laughs> well there, there there is waste but then you can make the argument that you know it's it's kind of not been wasted in a way it's been preserved because it's going to be photograph so i I mean it's it's being consumed in a way but it's not being consumed in the way yeah it's intended kind of thing yeah that's that's true and of course there are also many tricks and 
uh, in the industry that people perhaps aren't aware of. I mean, if you ever watch YouTube and look at some of the tricks of food photography, there are some great examples. For example, photographing ice cream is a, is a classic one. You know, you're trying to photograph ice cream before it melts is, mm. is obviously a big challenge. How do you overcome that? Well, actually, it's quite easy. You use mashed potato instead. Mm. Um, you know, it's it, there, there are all sorts of things you can do. Um, the, the famous one, the one that I always talk about is the pizza. You and I both know that when you cut a slice of pizza and pull it away from the main body of the pizza, most of the topping kind of comes up with it. Yeah. You end up with kind of just garlic bread at the bottom and, <laughs> and a load of a load of mess. So how you get over that in a photo shoot is they actually screw the pizza base down mm. to the to the board. Mm. Then they put a bit of jalapeno or uh, pepperoni over the screw so you can't see those. Mm. And then you actually have the pre-cut slice and you put PVA glue around the edges mm. so that when you lift it up, it, you get that lovely stringy effect, mm. but it's actually not cheese, it's PVA glue. <laughs> <laughs> so that is food waste because clearly no one's going to eat that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know there's a whole bunch of... Yeah, you, I've definitely seen at least one of the YouTube videos where they're like, "How do they do this?" and it's this, and you know. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. But you, you, you've got to, you know, because at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's an image. It's not reality. It, yes, know. yeah. I mean, it is. It, it, I, I do get worried about um, food waste because you know, in, in the back of your mind, you're always thinking about that as a mm -hmm. as an issue. And how you overcome that is 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 often a bit of a challenge. But mm. um, you're you're right. Ultimately, if there is any waste at all, in the sense that the food has been prepared and then not eaten, mm. um, it, it is still preserved in that image, and that image has served a purpose. So, mm. I, you know, I guess you know, for the greater good. Yeah, you know, I I mean, it's like. I've talked to a lot of theatre people on here and theatre is like, you know, incredibly wasteful because you build sets and then you tear them down and mm. you throw them in the mm. bin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You yeah. make costumes, which then it's like, I don't need this now. So, yes. you know, people have to think of ways to, to keep them going and keep keep reusing them and so on. Of course. Um, but yeah, there are loads of industries are incredibly destructive just on a... You know, without being a big factory, you know, just the actual practice of doing this as a job is quite waste creating. Yeah, yeah. But then, yeah, there's an element in which we are supposed to, you know, as humans, we are supposed to create waste. As as living things, we're supposed to create waste. And But then there's the idea of no waste in nature, of like it should be picked up and, you know, nature doesn't waste kind of thing. No, it recycles in yeah. some way, shape or form, yeah. Yeah, I guess, you know, going back to the environmental thing, it's, you know, it's just being aware of your impact really and trying mm. to avoid as much waste and as much damage as you can. Um, I, I totally agree with you. I think, you know, it would be very difficult now in the modern world to live a life where we are completely have zero impact on the environment, you know, mm. by our very nature of being, I guess. You know, if we're going to get existential about it, um, you know, we have an impact on the planet. Um, and as, as you should, you know, yeah, like, yeah, you're yeah. not, you're not legless. You don't want to walk <laughs> above the surface of the earth. It's like, you know. <laughs> float above it. Yeah. yeah. It's like, you want to leave footprints. You want to, you know, you want to break a branch. You want to, like, you know, you, you want to impact on the world. You want to jump in that fresh snow. You want to leave, yeah. leave yeah. something behind. Yeah. Um, that that's a natural kind of thing. Yeah. Like if when I go really into this sort of stuff, you know, I'm thinking about fire and heating our food and pre-digesting our food. And it's like, we really want to, it's like, is that wasteful of us? Or is that how we operate? Is that part of, you know, because we've, modern humans have evolved alongside fire. It's like, well, we could just eat salads. <laughs> Who wants to do that? Nobody. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> some of us, some of us, and I include myself, should be eating a lot more salads. <laughs> yeah, it's like 
being able to cook our food and pre-digest it and eat it and eat higher energy foods and evolve with smaller mouths and bigger brains, like all of these things are part of, of yeah. us. And I don't really buy the overpopulation thing. You know, I, I think it is just, you know, the, the ones that's doing the most damage are the ones with the ridiculously exorbitant footprints who are the ones who have the ridiculously exorbitant bank accounts and assets. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the majority of us, I think, are... Those, those same people are the ironic ones that are actually building space rockets to go somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> while telling us to change our light bulbs and our plastic bags. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think... Yeah, you can get lost down all of that. Like, there's a part of me when I'm thinking about collapse, I'm kind of like, well, you won't be able to watch telly and you can't have tea because that's both. <laughs> There'll be no apples. <laughs> that's if yeah. you're even a lie. But I think those are those are, are conversations that we need to start having in public rather than just in our own heads. Which I think yeah, we're I... left with a lot of the time. We're left with this kind of, you figure it out. It's like, yeah. what, on my own? <laughs> yeah and i think you i think you're actually right and i think we all have these internal dialogues and we all think that we have the solutions to problems mm. um but i think you know going back to the democracy thing if enough people come up with the same idea and then a way of implementing that idea then they should be taken notice of you know going back to the social media you know if there's some lunatic that's ranting on social media, well, you know, let's just, you know, ignore them if, you know, if they, if you don't like what they're saying, but when there's a whole group of people that have said, I think we should be doing this and this is how we can do it. This is how we can make it work. Then those people need to be listened to. And at the moment, I don't know how that's happening if indeed it is happening. Mm. And so I think, you know, I'd like to see a much more democratic society where we have more of an but, and, you know, the Brexit example is a good one, albeit that, you know, whether you, whichever side of the fence you sat on, you're probably not happy with what happened. Mm. Um, you know, I don't think Brexiteers are very happy with it, nor are the people that want it to remain because, it, mm. you know, it's been a, a, a hash on both sides. But it was still a democratic pr principle and a democratic process. And I think, you know, that more of that should happen. Mm. You know, I think I think there should be more referenda rather than less. Mm. Because I think that's the only way forward for democracy. We, we've kind of actually, you know, risk getting too deep into it. We have actually taken democracy away from ourselves in many ways. You know, mm. we've, we've passed the responsibilities of making decisions to a small group of people who mm -hmm. we don't really have any control over at all. Mm. You know, one of, one of the weird things about people in this country, and I think probably I'm sure in other Western societies is that we elect somebody like, you know, Sunak or, or Keir Starmer thinking that what they say is what's going to happen. The truth mm. of the matter is that they're not really running the country. It's the mm. people that are the, the, the bureaucrats and the civil servants. And the lobbyists to... that put them in. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it, it, you know, the risk of going too far down the political rabbit hole, you know, I'm not sure we live in a, in, in a proper democratic society and i don't even know what a proper democratic society would look like in the modern world because you know i can't think of an example where there is one i i, I would agree with you on you know pretty much all of that and i would say further that if you ask the majority of people like if we live you know, people will say we live in a democracy but if you stop and question them about it they, within two seconds they'll be like no we don't really live in a democracy like, mm. and i think the media, like I said to you about the climate change question, like the media will present this image to you, like you can't trip over without someone going, oh no, climate change doesn't exist. And the, and, and, you know, and if that's what you believe, fine, you know, whatever, you know, I don't want to take your whatever from you, mm. but the fact of the matter is I've done, you know, 60 odd of these and I haven't encountered a single person who's gone, oh, it's a load of rubbish. Like, that's a bit curious considering the image that we're presented with, to me mm. at least. Mm. And I think you get the same with democracy. I think, you know, we famously in this country, we'll, we'll moan about stuff, but like, 
politics is famously one of those areas of like don't discuss politics. I think yes. that's I think that's changing. Like, yeah, I really do think that's changing in this country, and I think that's a good thing. I think we need to talk about it more because we need to really crack open what we think and yeah, who absolutely. thinks what, and it's like, do we all just agree with what? the news agenda is set in and are we all just repeating that to each other in pubs or is there more going on here? Are people more nuanced than that? Do people have more interesting ideas even than the ones that are being put out there? Or, yeah. you know, it's like this assumption that if we ask a person when they get down into their politics, they're immediately going to go into something stupid. And I think, <laughs> I think we all feel that like I, I'm quite a political beast, mm. but I'm constantly aware of the fact that like when I'm saying something, Someone somewhere is going to be like, no, I hate that. And I hate you now because of that. <laughs> and I think we've all got a little bit of that feeling. I think even when we're in the social media space, I think there's a little bit, I think there's something in it is what I'm saying. I'm not saying that like, yeah, you know, but it'll sussed or anything, but I do think we need to talk about politics more. I think we need to be more realistic about it and need to talk about what we think and not what we think we should be thinking. And, you mm -hmm. know, not trying to kind of go, Okay, this is what seems to be the agreement, and I want to seem like I agree or I mm. disagree. Mm. Rather, uh, uh, yeah, there's something well, in think, there that I'm not quite explaining. Anyway, sorry. I'm yeah, sorry. no, I, and I think the interesting thing, and and this is a particular sort of passion of mine, is is, is when we put labels on people, and and politics is a is a prime example because you often say, well, what's your politics? And, you know, do you, you, are you a conservative voter or a Labour or a Liberal Democrat? You know, but that, that, that's too generalist because mm. I wouldn't agree with a lot of the Conservative manifesto. Mm. I certainly wouldn't agree with a lot of the Liberal Democrat manifesto. And there are elements of the Labour uh, manifesto that I probably wouldn't agree with either. But what you need to be is pragmatic and think, you know, I actually think that there are elements of everybody's ideas. Mm. You know, Rishi Sunak last yesterday said, for example, that he thinks that children should be educated or young people should be educated to the age of 18 in maths. Mm. I really agree with him. You know, absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. I hate maths and, and absolutely hated it at school. But if you could teach maths, to a decent level, right up to the age of 18. I think that, that sounds like a perfectly good idea. Does that mean that I would vote for him as the next prime minister? Absolutely not. Cause most of what else he says, I can't, I, you know, I can't agree with it. Mm. And I think, you know, the problem is that we, we now have a situation where we just put labels on people. Um, and like you say, you, you feel then as an individual that you have to conform to one of those labels, you know, mm. I, I'm a. I'm a white, you know, middle-aged man. Um, does that mean that I have to think like a mid a white middle-aged man? Does that make me a, a boomer or whatever mm. the, the current phraseology is? No, I'm an independent thinker. I think outside of, of those kind of groups of people, you know, my opinion on something will be completely different to someone who was born the same time as me. So don't, don't mm. lump me in with that then because I probably don't think the same way. Yeah, and you you will have you you know you've got your own discrete set of experiences and you yeah know, reactions and you know ideas and and ideas that you've encountered and the time that you encounter them of whether they land with you or resonate mm -hmm. with you and as well like this idea of with labeling people you know like can you do it from the way that they vote given how much people swing vote and so on it's like. Surely you're not the thing, and like unless you're a party member, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> you know, because nobody's not nobody's into it that much, really. You know, surely no. all the all the fanboys are the ones that are in the parties anyway, and girls. And well, it, well this is the well, this is the interesting, I guess. You know, this is the interesting thing with um, the recent situation with um, with our last prime minister, isn't it? You know, mm. when they said, right, well, we'll, we'll go out to the membership <laughs> to, to, to decide who should be the next prime minister mm. and look what happened there, you know, you just think, well, you know, if, if you go out to a bunch of people that are, you know, Tory members, you know, what did you expect <laughs> really? <laughs> you know, it's, you know, you're not going to get much of a diverse view of things, <laughs> you really. No, no.
you know, even if you are a Tory, you know, even if you vote Tory, you, you, you're still probably not quite the same as somebody who's a member of the Tory party. Oh God, no, yeah. 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 Uh, and, and you would probably not want to spend a lot of time. <laughs> I feel safe saying that thinking I'm not going to use this bit. <laughs> 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 so I'm I'm gonna wind it up there because we're nearly at yeah. Time. Yeah, I think Brilliant. we've got some extra little bits in there which would be quite nice to use. Excellent. Um, so I will thank you on the recording for doing this. Yeah, I loved it. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you again to Simon for being my guest. Thanks again to all my guests, and thanks to you, Leeds, for being my subject. And of course, most of all, thanks to you, my dear listener. I'm being quiet recently, aren't I? I think that's probably wise given the censorious turn we've now taken. Having said that, if you're sticking around, indulge me for a moment. If you want to rant, or you want to get me ranting, come and join me on Patreon or Ko-fi, or we could talk solutions if you're someone who can master your anger. If you feel like ranting on the show, feel free to do so. You can always have it cut out of your interview. It's good to get it out of your head and into the daylight. This show isn't just about promoting small businesses or Leeds University, you know, as much as it may seem like it might be. I also want this show to be about listening. Who really listens to what it's like to do your job? Who even knows about your job or what it is? Who cares? Well, I'm not sure that I care, but I am at least fascinated. Your life makes my life. How is that? Your spend is my income and my spend is yours. You're not getting much from me at the moment. Money is a manifestation of connection as much as it is anything else. A demonstration not only of independence, but of our very interdependence. Hashtag Silicon Valley Bank Collapse. The distraction of media from loss of life and increased human misery to censorship and celebrity, from potential nuclear annihilation to gossip, is structural and symptomatic. Our rights disappear, our incomes dwindle, our life expectancy decreases, our living standards fall. Profits and food banks grow, death rates increase, disasters increase, conflict and social unrest increase, temperature records get smashed, record droughts, floods, fires, famine will come into the spotlight. And magical thinking is already here, at least in the zeitgeist. Not so much on here though, no, here in the sleepy old Yorkshire, Things are more down to earth. Seems like real people are still largely reasonable. Annoyed, confused, scared, angry sometimes, but also practical, pragmatic, caring, thoughtful, and knowledgeable about what they do and how the collective actions of our species affects them. On the whole, people seem largely optimistic and hopeful to a degree. To several degrees more than me, at least. There's a thing that I love to come back to that Terence McKenna once said about watching a birth. Don't take this literally, and I'm paraphrasing it, but if you didn't know what was happening at a birth, it would seem like the most horrific and traumatic thing. But the end result of new life means a changed world. But successful birth isn't the only miracle, nor is falling in love. Connections, encounters, they can be life-changing and world-changing. Friendships, businesses, charities causes, companies, of people. Working is a social activity. It is social production and reproduction. No one is an island. Everyone takes and everyone gives. And putting all that on a balance sheet is, I feel, unfair and misrepresentative, as we can observe and experience in the form of its real-world results. You can follow this show on Twitter at Working Hours 3 and on Instagram at Working Hours Pod Lead. Use the hashtag Working Hours Pod Leads to stay up to date on when new episodes are being released. DM me with your questions or most importantly to get in touch if you'd like to be my guest on this show. Not destroying your brain with social media? Then send me an email to workinghourspod at western-studios.com or if you'd like to be anonymous, email me at westernstudios at protonmail.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember to share it with your networks. Please, please do chuck in anything you can to help working hours grow. Go to Kofi, that's ko-fi.com forward slash working hours and join me there for £3 a month. 
and or you can make any one-off donation of whatever amount through that site. Or you can go to patreon.com forward slash working hours pod to support working hours from as little as a pound a month. There's also an Outlander tier for non-loiners at £5 a month and a £12 a month big time tier for anyone who feels flash. I'm not really offering anything much on the Patreon yet as I'm already doing more than enough unpaid labour on this project. If and when things pick up then we'll see. The goal is to make the podcast and my commitment to it both possible and sustainable. If you are happy to make a regular contribution, but you're priced out by a pound a month, you can go to librapay.com, that's L-I-B-E-R-A-P-A-Y, dot com, forward slash Western Studios, forward slash donate, and donate from as low as a penny a week, all the way up to £89 a week. And people say I'm pessimistic. Again, you can also make one-off donations through LibraPay, which you can do either publicly or anonymously. Remember to like, share, follow and subscribe to Working Hours. Work for peace and plan with kindness. Okay, that's me. Cheers, ears. Take care out there and be kind to each other, Leeds. Working Hours is produced, recorded, edited and published by Simon Treen for Western Studios Leeds Limited. The music was The Bees from Chopin's Etude, which is in the public domain and was taken from museopen.org. Follow Western Studios Leeds on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash western underscore studios underscore leads. And on LinkedIn, linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash western hyphen studios or go to western hyphen studios.com. <laughs>